Welcome everybody to today's webinar sponsored by Cotton Incorporated and brought to you by Cotton Works. My name is Jennifer Lee and I'm the Manager of Marketing and Industry Programs for the Global Supply Chain Marketing Division at Cotton Incorporated. I will be moderating today's webinar. Cotton Incorporated is a not-for-profit organization that researches and promotes cotton with the goal of helping companies use more cotton in their products and improving their overall cotton business. Conworks.com is a free online resource for every stage of the product development and marketing process. Through Cottonworks, we bring you the latest and in innovative product me production methods, marketing trends, sustainability efforts, economic updates, non-woven education, and expert support, all so that you can stay up to date and inspired while you produce and market your cotton products. You can consider Cottonworks your go-to tool for discovering what's possible with cotton. Feel free to submit your comments at any time during the session. We've saved some time towards the end of this webinar to answer as many of your questions as possible related to today's topic. I would like to introduce you to today's speaker, Don Bailey, a textile education consultant for Cotton Incorporated. Don has led our textile education efforts and has over 40 years of experience in the industry, both at Cotton Incorporated and North Carolina State University. Now I'd like Don to, uh, to invite Don to start off today's presentation. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, uh, September 1st, uh, next month, will be my 50th year uh, working in the textile industry in some form. Uh, that's when I started Cotton Incorporated as a senior at NC State University's College of Textiles. And uh, I needed a job because I was uh, going to get married that fall. And uh, one of my professors recommended me uh, to start work maybe with a company that's just started in Raleigh, North Carolina, represent U.S. cotton growers. So that's where I, I got my start in textiles and it started in the physical testing area. Uh, I would come in somewhere around four on the days that I work, which is normally three, uh, most times five, uh, three to five days. And uh, the researchers at Cotton Incorporated didn't have labs when they first started because they hadn't built their building. So those researchers in textile chemistry and product development uh, would go to mills close by and, and, and even mills around the world to get time on the machinery to make yarns, fabrics, and, and garments. And uh, they would bring them back for testing. In order to influence and to uh, get a good reputation, uh, they would uh, try to turn this testing around very quickly so they could get the data back to the mills uh, and, and the brands and the retailers to show them how those cotton products would perform. So my job was I came in and I ran washers and dryers and cut out specimens in a conditioned lab so that uh, overnight, some nights I'd work all night long, I'd get five home laundrings, tumble dryings and conditioning in place so that they could the regular staff could come in the next day and do testing and get the data to the researchers. And they always would turn around these results in three days, no more than five at the most. So during that part of my early career, I won't talk about the rest of it. You have bio maybe, and maybe you'll see me in another class and we'll talk uh, according to that specific class, what my background is. But I did uh, a lot of work over the years in the pilling area. And I'll talk, uh, I'll bring up some of those examples, real life experiences for you later. And I hope that you have questions you will ask and uh, we'll take care of those later on. Uh, understanding of webinars, we do it a little differently than we do our regular uh, educational classes. But in any case, you'll get an answer. And I promise you, I'll answer every single question uh, that uh, we get, if not in, during this hour, but certainly uh, it'll be available to you uh, through uh, Jennifer. So this is a good example of a fabric, a knit fabric, single jersey looks like, uh, that has pilled. And these pills are small balls. We like to call them small balls of entangled fibers that are on the surface of the fabric and they're attached. Now, some of you may have heard of the term NEPS, N-E-P-S. Uh, that is not a pill, although it is an entanglement of fibers. It's something that happens sometimes we want it to, but most times we don't in spinning, uh, fiber preparation and spinning. And uh, these NEPS get spun into the yarn itself. They're, they're kind of like a slub, but slub tends to be longer, sometimes, most times thicker. Uh, these naps are very small, but pills are not 
spun into the yarn. Pills are entangled fibers on the surface of a fabric or a material. Now, what you see here is uh, an artist's uh, depiction, in this case, mine, of a fabric. We see this horizontal fabric. I'll use my giant cursor to point it out. And this fabric could be a knit or woven or non-woven for that matter. And uh, we have what are called anchor fibers. These are fibers that stick up, excuse me, stick up off the surface of the fabric. And you can see on your bottom right, we have a pill. And down in here, those are entangled fibers. And they're entangled with these anchor fibers onto the surface of a fabric. So my little crude drawing was turned into this nice animation uh, at, by Cotton Incorporated. And it shows just the accumulation of loose fibers, fibers that are we call lint, uh, that are not now in the fabric, but they can get reattached. And we'll tell you how they attach in, in just a few moments. And uh, these can be quite large, or sometimes it just may be an area that's very fuzzy with very small pills, but that would be a good example of what a, a pill would look like. Uh, again, looking at a knit fabric, which tend to be um, worse for pilling than wovens, but it's not just knits that, that pill, obviously, wovens do it as well. But when we think about knit fabrics, we think about soft spun yarns. And one thing some, that makes these yarns soft is they have fibers sticking up off the surface. So this fabric happens to be a cotton polyester fabric. And uh, as it's spun together, the polyester fibers are cut into a length that's similar to the a staple length of the cotton fibers. And when they're spun together, uh, they can give you attributes that you might not get with just cotton and certainly you wouldn't get with just polyester. So these anchors are fibers that are typically very strong. Uh, we could have a cotton fiber, we'll talk about that later, that would be strong and form an anchor. But this particular sample, this is uh, these anchors are polyester uh, fibers that are spun into the structure uh, these fibers are all the same length, normally inch and a quarter, inch and a half, compared to the cotton, which could be an, an inch to an inch and a fourth, maybe longer if it's long staple. But in any case, these polyester fibers are strong, they're tough, and they stick up off the surface. And if there's any loose lint uh, in or around that fabric, especially in wet conditions, like in a jet dye machine or a garment dye machine in a mill or in a, uh, a laundry, uh, that you would take your clothes to or certainly in your home. So we get these entangled fibers. And uh, so this loose lint uh, is, is typically what you would see, for example, uh, when you look at the screen in your dryer, your uh, tumble dryer at home, you have to check that screen because it gets a lot of short fiber in it. So that's, that's an example of where the fiber comes from. Uh, we have some uh, fibers that are very strong, like longer staple polyester spun with uh, wool, for example, both those fibers are longer and both of those fibers are very strong and both those fibers stick off the surface and they actually can entangle with each other. So that's what we mean by anchor fibers entangling with other anchor fibers. So uh, we, we wanna be able when we uh, test the uh, potential for a fabric or a garment to peel and, and you hear me say, uh, fabric a lot because uh, we, we uh, don't wear just pieces of fabric, we wear garments. Uh, garments uh, peel because the fabric in them peels. So we're gonna, we're gonna think about yarn, fiber, fabric, and garments that can have pills on them. But we'll be mostly talking about that phenomena that relates to the fibers in the yarn. So anyway, uh, we have different test methods around the world, but ASTM and ISO are the most common where we can rate pilling resistance. We'll talk about this a little later. And pilling resistance is defined as the measurement of the tendency of a material or fabric to form pills on its surface. So we're, we're gonna use a scale here that is an inverse scale, meaning that a five would be uh, perfect and a one would be horrible. Uh, so we'll get into that a little later as well. Uh, we like fabrics that are soft generally. Uh, sometimes if, and they're usually soft because the fibers are on the surface sticking up. And we like that a lot of times because it makes that fabric surface softer. Uh, but if we want a fabric that we can see the structure very clearly, uh, and we don't want a lot of surface fiber, uh, then we could do things we'll talk about like singeing, or you could use plied yarns and it raises the cost, but it does give you that cleaner surface. 
And we'll talk about uh, things we can do in the dye house, uh, like enzyme treatments or singeing to get rid of some of this surface hair. But again, the, the peeling phenomena, if we want to call it a phenomena, is a surface phenomena typically. Now that may mean the outer surface of a sweater, but certainly it also means the inner surface as well. So when we have pills that, uh, that are accompanied by other surface phenomena, we can have problems. We can lose cover on the surface of the fabric. That means we lose a lot of fibers. Now we can have color change uh, as a phenomenon that goes along with peeling. Uh, localized frosting, uh, that's something that used to be a huge problem with cotton polyester. We'll talk about that later. And certainly fuzzing. Uh, everybody's got their favorite shirt, maybe knit shirt that uh, has fuzz over time or sweater. And uh, if you could enzyme treat and it's all cotton in your house, you would restore that color back in most cases. So these are things that are happening on the surface. I'd like to tell you that there, we think in terms of researchers, uh, and you should in your business, there's two types of pills. One we call a laundry pill. Some people call it a lint pill, meaning there's loose lint that's off the surface, but it gets entangled with the um, anchor fibers. And then we have what are called regular or natural pills. And let's spend a second talking about that. Uh, most pills that are formed in laundering, and when we say laundering, we mean washing, certainly with water, but it can happen in dry cleaning processes uh, because we can lose fibers and the, the tumbling of a fabric wet, whether it's water or a dry cleaning solvent, is going to cause some surface distortion. Uh, so uh, it also happens in the tumble dryer. As it dries, we're getting a lot of abrasion as well. And we have a high population uh, in both those wet and dry areas of lint. And again, that's why we have lint fillers. So if we look at a, a typical laundry pill, if you look at your bottom left, again, using my giant cursor, you can see that's a very large pill. And it, it, that would represent the types you see on the upper left. So those are all pills, uh, not nips, but pills. And some of them are very fuzzy. And I think you can see if it shows as well as it does on my laptop, in between these pills, I can see that these uh, yarn surfaces, these loops are fuzzy. Uh, let's look closer at a laundry pill. On the left, we have a woven, and on the right, we have uh, a knit. And uh, notice that on the right, this looks like it was a heather. At least we have a lot of black fiber and we have white fiber. Now, that white fiber, a lot of times, doesn't come off the fabric that you own your garment that peels, it actually may come off something else in that laundry load. So if you think you have a problem, uh, a, a garment that may become a problem as a consumer with peeling, then I recommend you don't put something in there. This is being silly guys, but I'm gonna be silly a little bit. Don't put a towel in there. <laughs> don't put a fleece fabric in there because you're just adding a lot of lint to that bath. So that's, that's the kind of thing that I actually like to do in the testing lab on some developments I did over the years, I would tell them to put a towel in there. I wanted to see uh, just what would happen. So these regular natural pills, however, are a little different. Uh, they're formed during wearing. And all of you have probably got a, a blouse or a knit a woven shirt for a blouse or a woven shirt that's uh, maybe cotton polyester, maybe it's 100% cotton. And under the sleeves where your sleeve rubs against the underarm on your shirt as you move your arm back and forth, uh, guys, especially around the collar, if you have a beard uh, or, or you have you know, a little stubble there and you turn your head, you'll see right inside that collar that you'll, you'll have uh, some pills form. And a lot of times in the uh, crotch area of pants or slacks, we have pills that form. And these may be things that we haven't even washed yet, maybe the first time we've worn them. So we refer to those as regular pills or natural pills or wear pills. And so I'm gonna show you some examples of those. In this case, now this is how you can tell, here's one way I always could tell if it was a natural pill or a laundry pill. In a natural pill, the fibers that form the anchor and the lint come from the same fabric. So if I got a pair of navy slacks and they got white pills, on them, 
uh, that came from laundry. I would just about bet you money because there's no white fiber in those slacks I'm talking about. On the left is a uh, is a knit uh, shirt with a uh, it's got a sewn hem bottom in it. It's got an argyle pattern. We're not in a design class, but I want you to look around the edges of this fabric. Uh, it has uh, it has natural pills hanging all over the place. And you've seen these yourself, and they may be just kind of look like they're floating in the air, but if you look at it closely, there'll be a short fiber there, just like on your right here. You see that this looks like it's floating, but it's actually attached by these fibers off the surface. Uh, both of these fabrics had animal fiber in them. Uh, this is an example of a fleeced garment uh, that uh, was sheared very short on the inside, the side that had the fleece next to the body. And this is the inside of the sleeve. I just turned the sleeve inside out, took a picture. And you see, there's just hundreds and hundreds of pills that are, are natural pills caused by the rubbing of these fibers on the surface. And then on this, this next fabric, the bottom left, you can see that a lot of that looks just like it's fuzzy, but these fibers are long coming off the surface. Uh, they get uh, rolled up together. Now, back when I was young, say middle school age, we're talking about in the um, early 60s, uh, guys would take and grab a person's arm and they would rub their uh, hand round around in circles and it would entangle the hairs on the surface of the arm. That would be the same as a natural pill, I'll give you an analogy. Now, this is a cashmere sweater. And I know the history on this sweater because on the left, you see the sweater before anywhere at all, brand new. And on the right, this is after uh, just wearing it. It hadn't been laundered or dry cleaned or anything. And notice that we're seeing these pills form. Uh, cashmere has very long fibers. And over multiple wearings, we tend to get a lot of, uh, of these natural pills. I looked online last night just to see if they still sold uh, uh, sharing uh, machines. In other words, it was like an electric shaver but not for uh, someone's beard, but for pills on the surface of the fabric. They still have these. But these cashmere fibers, animal fibers, acrylic, polyester, long staples, uh, in sweaters, for example, blankets, things of that nature, big, fat, soft yarns that get fuzzy. We see a lot of this type of thing going on. Uh, we also want to mention to you that a snag looks like a pill, and, and they, some people think, well, you know, this happened before we ever washed it, uh, and sometimes after. What kind of pill is that? Well, it's not a pill. This is a 100% filament polyester uh, garment, and something rough or something that protruded into the uh, fabric surface pulls some of these fibers out, and they get all entangled, and that's the snag. It looks like a pill, and, you know, to the consumer, they don't care whether it's a snag or a pill. They don't like the way it looks. And if it's, for example, how many of you have had uh, blended sheeting that gets pills all over the bed sheet? So, you know, it's not a, it doesn't feel good always. So we'll, we'll summarize and say there's two types of pills that can form textile products. And uh, it's fairly complex when you really look at it because when people ask you as a, as a researcher, tech service person, what caused it, well, you know, I always said, you got to give me a little bit of information here. I got to study this a little bit. I got to do some of my own testing because there are several factors that can uh, can contribute to that. And actually, some of them can be uh, uh, changed, modified or replaced to improve the pilling. So what type of fiber or blend of fibers is in that product? If we look at not just polyester, it shows here, Dan, your fiber finest for polyester, nylon, and other uh, nat uh, synthetic fibers. Well, what is the fineness of animal fibers? What's the fineness of the cotton? What kind of yarn is it? What's the fabric construction? What kind of finishing took place during processing? And then what is the end use for it? All these are things that, um, that we want to take a look at. The Olympics are going on now, and I watch these daredevils on the uh, skateboards and they do some crazy stuff. It's a wonder some of them don't get seriously hurt and I guess they do. 
but I can't imagine what it would look like to have a fleece with the pile side out and you hit the concrete a few times. It's probably going to uh, create some effects there. So the way we use it, the end use for it is important. Let's talk about fiber and yarn. Uh, if we talk about cotton and blends of cotton and other fibers, uh, we're spinning on a short staple system. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. These are what we call spun yarns. And what we do is we have an assembly of fibers that we twist in one direction or the other to create a twist helix. In other words, it's a spiraling of the fibers around the center axis, and we get uh, a hairy surface. Uh, this is a typical uh, looking uh, surface for a fiber. And uh, the lower the twist we have in there, uh, the more there's a tendency for shorter fibers in that mix to fall out. Now we can cut polyester and acrylic and uh, nylon to spin with cotton or to spin with wool. And we'll cut them a length that matches the natural fibers length. So for cotton, uh, typically an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half would be the length we'd cut polyester to spin with that cotton, which would be somewhere under an inch and a half in length. But all those cotton fibers aren't the same length. So some of those are going to uh, are going to fall out. So uh, we can look at how much twist is in the fabric. That affects the strength, it affects the hairiness, it affects other things like torque, et cetera, but we're only gonna talk about peeling. So in studies we've done at Cotton Incorporated, the original study we did was in 19, started in 1973, and it culminated in 1975 with the introduction of what we called natural blend cotton polyester. It was 60% minimum cotton, 40% polyester. And uh, we did a lot of work on those. And um, at that point in, in history, uh, cotton was only seen in 35 cotton, 65 poly and 50-50. So Cotton Incorporated decided that we would study what blend level would give us the best attributes of cotton and, and get the benefits we thought that we needed from poly. And, but we didn't see a single blend level that didn't peel some. So in about, about 2000, our spinners did a, a, another study like that. Uh, and they did it because the technology and spinning had changed so much. So they made 100% cotton yarns was one of the yarns they made, 18 singles carded, and they made uh, uh, 18 gauge, 18 cut single jersey fabric. The fabric part of it is all the same on all these yarns. And what they found was uh, using good carded fiber that the ring spun uh, didn't peel a lot, just a little bit after 60 minutes. The open end uh, peeled more and the air, uh, Vortex air jet spun yarn didn't peel at all. Uh, so I'm just gonna show a little bit of that data. So what's different about these spinning systems? There must be some difference. And so uh, we'll, get, we'll get into that a little deeper. So in adding polyester to this study back in the early 70s and recently, we found out certainly that the more man-made fiber we had in the yarns, the more we had peeling. And that was because we had more anchors. And another thing was going on too, guys, the uh, spinners that made uh, these blended yarns found out that the polyester gave that yarn all the strength it needed. So they didn't need to have the cotton there for strength, they needed it there for comfort. So they to keep the cost low, they tended to use cotton that had shorter fiber content and therefore they had more length. But to make 100% cotton fabric, uh, we'd have to use good quality fiber uh, because we needed to have good strength and they did not peel. And so those are the kind of things that we, we looked at. Uh, this is an example on your right. Again, uh, it's a single jersey fabric, so our go-to fabric. I like interlock as well, because if those don't peel, you're gonna have very good luck in other areas. So uh, these again are, are blends of cotton polyester. This is a 60-40, and you can see that we did have accumulation of pills. So let's take a look further. These are all ring spun yarns. All of them had the same size yarn with the same cotton fiber, but they added different levels of polyester. So we start at the top 100% cotton and at the bottom only 35%. So as you go down on this slide, the pilling gets worse and it gets worse because we have more anchor fibers. There's more polyester there. Now, when, when just think about this. 
if you've ever used pruners to cut roses or to cut some uh, type of, cut something with uh, pruners or even scissors, you know, sometimes when you cut that item, it doesn't cut all the way through and it leaves a little jagged edge on there. So when we looked under a microscope uh, at very high resolution, we saw a lot of those uh, anchor fibers on the end, they weren't smoothly cut all the way across. They had a little barb on it. Not like a fish hook, but you know, had a little barb on the end. And these would really grab and hold lint to, to cause more pilling to take place. Now that's ring spun. Now I'm gonna go forward to an air jet. This is MVS. Again, the same uh, fiber mix, but spinning the yarn differently. Now look at the improvement in the 3565 on pilling is still not good. It's not, I wouldn't want to take it home and brag about it, but, but still um, we can see that MVS was better. Uh, so at the end of the day, we know that ring spun and open end pill in similar ways. Uh, and, and that's using the same fiber and all those same yarn count, but the vortex was better. The problem is look at the range of yarns we can make on open end from a very coarse one singles up to about a 40 single. So if you're making a product with a 60 singles, you can't use open end. Uh, if we look at uh, the ring spun, we can go from uh, the very coarsest of course, all the way up to over hundred singles uh, using uh, longer staple cotton fiber for the higher, finer counts. Well, uh, we got a wider range of products we can make. And then if you look at the MVS Vortex, it says 20 to 80s, but I'm thinking more like 20s to 50s. So that just shows you can't always substitute in every case one yarn for another. Uh, this is our uh, title slide we started off with today, the fabric. And this is a heather. It's 50-50 cotton polyester. The cotton's white and the polyester is black. Uh, again, we get back to the anchor situation. Uh, but we tested this on the random pill tester. So here's something you need to know if you're not familiar with the ASDM or ISO uh, pilling test. Uh, in the random pill tester, we add a known weight to every test of, of cotton fiber that's a standard fiber that's been cut, I think it's a quarter of an inch. It might be a half, but I'm pretty sure it's a quarter inch. It's been a while since I ran it. So we're introducing short fiber into this test method. It's a dry test. I, I personally have wet the samples and extracted them and run them in there as well. And uh, seem to that's not the test method that I know, but I did it anyway. I wanted to see what would happen. And uh, certainly, 50-50 in this particular fabric, it's certainly not a great fabric for pilling. Uh, so uh, what happens though, if you look at the polyester portion and decide, can I change that polyester to improve it? So here, these are both 50-50 blends of cotton and poly. And on the top one, we use 1.2 denier, which is finer than the bottom one, which is 1.5 denier. Uh, so we did get a, a marginal improvement here just by going up three tenths of a, a denier on the polyester portion, but still this is, a, this is a mediocre performance. We want to be four or higher. Uh, where do we see these blended yarns? Well, one place we see them a lot is on the fleece side of, of fleeces, which be the technical back, whether it be three in or two in. And we also see uh, these blended yarns on a two in fleece on the surface as well. The, the technical face. So uh, I wish the one on the right was a little better resolution, but it had peeled so badly, I couldn't get it more, more resolved than that. So, uh, so this fabric peels on both sides because the polyester is put in there to help you guys and to help the mills pass the general flammability test. If you put polyester in that a yarn that snapped, uh, or in the case of French terry, it's just uh, uh, on the on the side on the face of the fabric or the back, whichever you choose that loop side to be. Uh, you don't want any surface flash, so you can put a poly in there and it stops it, uh, but it doesn't help you in the pilling. So I want you to look at this another way too. I want you to really be scientist. And so what I made here is I made 100% cotton yarn. We took and did a cross section of this, so to speak. And you see those cotton fibers there, and we know they're, they're short staple. And if you look down the length of that yarn, you would see the ends of them somewhere. 
And on your left, we have a 65 cotton, 35 polyester, and we have a fairly coarse denier polyester, 2.25, and the cotton's the same in both of them, 1.5. And then on the right, we have uh, a 1.25 denier poly. I want to tell you a story here, and you'll find this, I, I hope, helpful. Uh, most all the fleece manufacturers in the United States up until about the year uh, 1992 or three, used coarser denier in their fleece fabrics because they knew it didn't peel as much as a finer denier. So uh, this new company was formed by a gentleman buying out several different textile companies, which included some large spinning companies and also a company he bought did fleece. And so he made them change from using that a very coarse denier, the 2.25, to using the same denier he used in all of his other uh, cotton blended uh, fabrics with polyester. And immediately the pilling got so bad, they got a lot of returns. So what's the, what's the reason there? So I've helped you out here. If you counted these larger uh, denier polyesters to make a 65-35 blend, you'd need 16 of these polyester fibers. But when we go up to the finer denier to have that same blend level, now we've got a 50% increase in the polyester fibers. So now we have a 50% increase in anchor fibers, and that's the result right there on your right. So uh, again, uh, once we form that yarn, there's very little we can do to stop it from peeling, but there are some things we can do that will improve it. Now let's go back to the three spanning systems. Uh, this 100% cotton, now we're looking at a, a double piquet, I think it is. And we've got MVSs at the top, the air jets at the top, the rotor and the ring at the bottom, 50 laundrings. We want it, and then, then uh, tumble dryings on top of that. So we got very good results. We don't see any really obvious large pills there, uh, but we do see some, and with the MVS being the best. So how do we test them? There's three ways we test for pilling today. Um, the random pill tester, the Martindale tester, and the pilling box. The pilling box originated in Asia. Uh, I'm pretty sure it did. That's where I saw it first. And uh, they all are good methods. I don't have a problem with them. What you need to make sure is that the person that tests your product and the mill you're buying from and, and, and maybe your own lab at your place or anybody else that tests all use the same test and that they go strictly by the book. So the random pill tester is ASTM method, uh, pill resistance and other related surface changes of textile fabrics, random pill, tumble, pilling tester. Uh, this is a modern version. What you have is you have a cylinder that's got a cork liner and you got an impeller and you put three specimens in there of your sample. They're cut in a diamond shape, four by four and we glue the edges so they don't unravel and they're put in there. But before this machine starts running, we put some loose lint in there. Again, we cut a certain uh, weight and a certain length of lint, test lint to put in there. And we tumble it 30 minutes, it's taken out, it's rated. And if it didn't peel worse than a, a three, they'll run it another 30 minutes. And that's a very loose description of the test. So that test lint is important. Uh, at cotton, it comes in a gray color, a gray color, uh, the color gray, not grayish, uh, which is like the natural color cotton, but a gray color. Uh, we've also, we, we got the fiber from the people that made the test fiber. We dyed some black in our study and we bleached some white just so we could see it better on different colors of samples. So this, uh, You can see this is a modern uh, random pill tester. And uh, the original one, uh, you had uh, sometimes the samples would hang up and you'd have to take the door off and put some air in there and then you lost all your lint. But the modern machines, they insert air in there just to keep them from uh, hanging up, they call it. So we'll watch this one more time. They just stopped it so you can get a look. There's three specimens, and uh, this is a two-position tester. They make them with six cylinders in them. Uh, the machine, if you go to Cotton Incorporated, it runs every single day.
So uh, the abrasion on that cork is not severe, but it is with that impeller, a random uh, abrasion. And it allows us to uh, strike that surface many, many times during that 30 minutes. And by the way, you can work with your uh, customer or your supplier to determine if you wanna do two hours or, or, or 15 minutes. That might be off the test method, but people do stuff like that. Now, cotton fibers uh, can be anchor fibers too. I want you to look at this third bullet, but if they're not very strong, uh, they can break off during the test. I've seen samples that look worse in 30 minutes than they did after 60 minutes. That's why I always, regardless of the data, uh, when I turn something in after 30 minutes, I want them to go ahead and run it another 30. And I have seen many times after 60 minutes, the peeling rating actually get better on 100% cotton, which sometimes can peel. So this just tells you that we rate it on a five point scale. Uh, you can see you use, you use standard lighting. The test method specifically tells you what to look at. You mount the sample at a, at a 45 degree angle to the lights in a special place. You have the replica that's given to you uh, by the test method, whether it be ISO or ASTM, this is ASTM. And you rate the sample according to those specimens, five being no peeling to one being very severe. So this just shows you a woven fabric and you can see there's no peeling. And uh, then that's the same uh, construction, however they made it, I don't know how they made it, and it's got a very severe peeling. Even Don Bailey would say run that one another 30 minutes. So five point scale, uh, if it passes after 30 minutes, then uh, most people want it run another 30 for a total 60. And uh, if, if it fails, though, a lot of people quit because testing labs are, are busy. And this shows uh, one of those specimens of the three. Uh, we always rated three specimens and each specimen was rated by three people when we did our research work. And I think you guys can see here that they're both blue and they're white pills on this fabric. So uh, that, uh, I'm not sure what was added to it. I know the white pill fiber was added to it. So this fabric may have been one that um, had some natural pilling as well. This little crazy looking machine is a Martindale tester. This is the most modern version. And uh, it is, uh, a lot of people like this method more than they do the random pill test. We'll take a look at how it works. You got a sample that's mounted on the upper, uh, uh, rubber, I'll call it, I can't think of the name of that right now, pedestal, and is rubbed against an abrasive surface or against itself, depending on what you want in the method. Uh, this same tester can do abrasion test. So we can see as this sample's running, you can see uh, loose fibers coming off that sample and it's getting onto the surface of the abrasive. Again, you run the fabric against itself or against the standard um, abrasion. Okay, let's go back. It's, it's, it's not wanting me to go back, but we're going back anyway. So you can see here's the size of the sample. It's a, it's a little bit bigger than a silver dollar, somewhere maybe a little bigger, a little smaller. And it moves in a completely uh, random elliptical pattern. So everything is, is processed. And uh, I like this one personally for natural pills better than I do the other one. That's not to say you can't get natural pills on the other one, but you see here, I wish you could see my hands because I'm rubbing them together in a random manner. And as I rub my hands together, it gets hotter and anything that's in there starts to roll up. So this to me is better for the, um, uh, for the natural pill. And I like the random pill tester certainly for both that in and that. Uh, specimens of the same fabric are mounted on them. This comes directly from Cotton Works and the Quality Assurance CD, you can uh, go to uh, Cotton Works, go to resources, go to topic, go to quality assurance. And there's all kinds of test methods there. This is an older system, but you see the samples mounted. And now this is the same fabric that's gonna be put on the bottom. They're gonna rub that fabric against itself. And um, which is typical of what you would see under the arm between the legs. Uh, so it can do, I think, uh, random. Uh, I get natural pills as well as laundry pills, give you an example. But uh, 
technicians trained, certified by AATCC, ASTM to run these tests, they're what you need. And they uh, will give you results that you can put some confidence in. So you'll see this is the older machine, but the elliptical pattern is uh, again the same. So Martindale, uh, you saw there six positions, I think, on, on most of the tests or some are less. And so we're gonna rate the top sample. We're gonna rub the fabric against itself. It's not a heavy weight, but there are abilities on these uh, systems, especially for abrasion, to increase the weight. And uh, so some of the fabric restrictions from Martindale, which doesn't seem to affect the random peel of the box, is that pile fabrics and fleece fabrics don't run well on that tester. The fabric will stretch and distort on the surface is one of the problems. And uh, uh, other fabrics that might be a little bit difficult or waffles, seersuckers, thermals, and similar constructions. This is two examples of uh, box uh, peeling tests, this IO, ISO test. And I wanna show you that inside the box, which turns on that machine, we have four tubes like PVC pipe that are wrapped with our fabric that we want to be their abradant. And then inside the box is wrapped in cork, uh, similar to the random pill tester. And so we have the plastic tube, the fabric, uh, sandpaper uh, is not on there. That's, uh, that is wrong right here. I have to change that. Uh, sandpaper, uh, cork liner goes inside there. Your sample would be there. And that's the abrasion, not sandpaper. Okay, uh, so again, uh, a standardized test. I'm not as familiar with it, but again, anytime you run testing, you can work with your supplier to uh, look at different uh, things. Uh, what can we do now to prevent fabrics that are already made that are, we know are going to peel? What can we do to improve the peeling? Well, one is that this is a fabric has been singed and it burned all the surface hairs off including anchors, which if it's poly would melt. This is a cellulase enzyme treatment in a, a garment wash machine or a jet. And then of course we can always go to the shearing machine. So this uh, machine is a, a uh, singeing machine and this is fabric going about 300 meters a minute. And on the surface of that fabric, we're striking that with a gas flame and it burns off any uh, fiber like cotton rayon that will combust or burn. And if it's a synthetic, it'll melt those fabric fibers that are sticking up right to the surface. So we know that that will improve the uh, peeling. We also can send yarns. This is a yarn before and after singeing. It's applied yarn of all things. You wouldn't think they could be fuzzy, but it is. And uh, typically singeing yarn was called gassing. You still see that term some. If you do, it means it was singed. And it's done on a machine that where the yarn goes from a supply package at the bottom here up through this chamber where we have our gas flame and then the surface hairs are burnt off and then the yarn's rolled up. Now, you know, this is like Jimmy John's. This machine has to be freaky fast. It has to operate at 1,000 to 1,500 meters a minute to keep the yarns from being burned in two. And what I like about it, it can run from a very coarse yarn to a very fine yarn and these machines can be in a operation like a knitting, a sweater house, or even in a woven house where we singe just the yarns that we know might be a problem. It wouldn't be something we do all the time. It might just be a lot. We've noticed the peeling went up so we can singe it. Uh, this is a sweater fabric it's folded over a ruler that I did enzyme treatment on. This, uh, this applied eight cut or seven cut, I don't remember which, a sweater knit fabric jersey was just really fuzzy and had a lot of uh, wear pills. And so I took those sweaters and I treat them with an enzyme, which attacks the cotton fiber, the cellulase enzyme attack the cotton fiber and remove the surface hair. Another way we can get the fibers off, and let me just show you that uh, this is used on uh, fleece and pile fabrics that maybe don't have the most uniform surface, and maybe on some fabrics that are just regular fabrics, but they're hairy. And so where these two, the circular blade and this straight blade, which is called a ledger blade, where they, as this cylinder turns with all these uh, uh, rotating blades on it, because they spiral wherever they're touching this lower blade, anything that's sticking up in there 
uh, gets um, gets removed. And so this shows the spiraling blades around the outside. Again, this is on the Cottonworks site. And uh, we have a vacuum to pull the loose lint off. Now we're gonna cut fibers off. So we don't want them to stay on the fabric, we want them vacuumed off so they don't uh, contribute to uh, lint and peel in a, in a machine that's a wet process. So you see these uh, loops are cut off. This same thing could happen uh, to a fabric that's already been uh, napped. Just get those loose fibers off the surface to reduce the effect of the uh, of the anchors. Okay, methods to improve uh, with short staples. We want to keep the short fiber content to minimum. Uh, our staple length is an average of long ones and short ones together, and we want to try to get all the short ones we out we can. That would be fibers at less than a half an inch. Uh, we can if we got a yarn that's causing us problems and it's a big program and we're still spinning it. We can increase the twist level, which prevents uh, shedding of the fiber in the dye machines or laundry machines. In blends of cotton and polyester, we want to keep the poly content to less than 20% and have a denier uh, no larger than 1.5 denier. There is a low pill polyester, it's a weaker polyester that some people use. I don't even know whether it's available anymore. At one time it was. And when we use filament yarns, 100% uh, filament fabric, let's go as fine a gauge as we can and yarns that are not texturized uh, to uh, prevent a lot of surface area. Singeing, I talked about enzyme treatments, shearing. And another method that we see a lot is that uh, we did a lot of wrinkle resistant finish at Cotton Incorporated over the years. And we always had a control that was not wrinkle resistant and uh, especially on blends, but, uh, but just at regular 100% cotton, uh, the surface was better, less fuzzy if it was resin finished than it was if it was not. And so that means that resin finish weakens those fibers on the surface some, and it causes them to break off during laundering and they don't contribute uh, to the pilling because they're not anchors anymore. I uh, thank you for your time. I'm gonna turn this back over to uh, Jennifer and uh, she'll close us out. Uh, thank you so much, Don. I think that was a lot of really great information, especially the summary at the end um, to help everyone remember all of the many factors that go into pilling. Uh, we're seeing lots of questions coming in, so I'm going to give everyone a couple more seconds to submit those questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And while we wait, wait, let me tell you a couple things related to today's presentation. Um, a recording of today's webinar as well as its slides will be available on our website at cottonworks.com slash webinars. And could you pull up the next slide, Don? Yep. I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, on this page, you can find other past webinars, including webinars on cotton biodegradability, cotton's life cycle assessment, and more. Um, and then please take a minute after our Q&A to fill out a short survey about today's webinar. The survey will automatically open at the conclusion of the webinar. We'd like to hear your thoughts on today's webinar and what sort of topics you would like to see covered in the future. Um, now let's get to these questions. Um, Don, there's quite a few questions about the effect of staple length on cotton pilling. Um, so could you please um, talk a little bit more about if it's long staples that cause pilling from cotton or if it's short staples and, and how important is it? Well, yeah, that's a good question. And it's always a question that came up when we did tech service trials with Mills brand and retail. Uh, you have to have a happy medium. You need enough long fibers in there to generate the strength you need uh, to make the products that you wanna make and to reduce lint shedding because they will help tie in those short fibers. Uh, but we all know that uh, when you get a, a yarn made for your product, it's not always the very, very best you can get. You uh, or they will have standards for strength and all kinds of other things for these yarns to meet. So they may use some fibers in that fiber mix that are shorter. Uh, what you don't want to have happen is where a large percentage of those fibers are short fibers because now you're contributing a lot of lint into that test. Uh, I've never seen personally um, a lot of pilling on 100% cotton that uh, that had good average staple length. 
Uh, sometimes I've seen some extra long staple uh, cotton fibers that you can find around the world and, uh, and, and everywhere. You can get the extra long staple. And those fibers can be pretty strong. And depending on the structure, uh, if it's a low twist product, they may form anchors that uh, you will encounter some peeling, but it's normally not ever worse than a four, in my opinion. The, the more important thing about this staple length side is don't put a lot of short uh, fibers in there to generate a lot of length. Awesome. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the anti-pilling treatments and how they have an effect on the hand of fabrics, uh, especially quite a few people are asking about how singeing might change the hand of the fabric? Sure. Uh, well, let's, let's think about, uh, to help you understand this, the products most often singed in textiles are wovens. Uh, we do have knit good singers that can uh, singe both open width and tubular. But uh, normally we're thinking about uh, shirtings, sheetings, uh, slacks. And uh, we want uh, those fabrics to have nice smooth surface that looks uh, vibrant, I'll call it. I don't know what that means. I can't measure it with a number, but a very clean surface, good luster. And uh, so we can uh, use singeing on those. Our good friend and colleague, Leon Moser, worked in a worsted plant, and they would singe worsted fibers uh, to clean up the surface so it wouldn't be so many hairs there and make the shade look dull. But they're very strong and to prevent them from peeling uh, in cleaning. Now, the thing about a worsted product, it's gonna be dry clean. Uh, so I don't know about you, but when we have dry cleaning done, I'll tell the dry cleaner on the suit, I don't want in there with nothing but a suit. Don't throw somebody that wanted to uh, dry clean their, their knit shirt, uh, cotton knit shirt, don't throw that in there with it. I don't want it in there. I want it done separately. Uh, so uh, that is that is uh, very important to clean that surface up for uh, visual reasons. It looks more lustrous, it looks cleaner. And at the same time, it's gonna help you on your peeling. Awesome. Um, what about the enzyme treatments? Do, do that, does that affect the hand of the fabric at all? Uh, well, that's a good point. And going back to sharing the same thing, when you remove surface hairs, uh, you'll tend to make the surface less slick or soft, depending on uh, what term you like to use. Now, remember the type of softeners that you use in finishing can overcome a lot of these things. But uh, when I take and remove the surface hair off a sweater with uh, enzymes or off socks or slacks or any other thing, and by the way, you, you guys know that a lot of our detergents have enzymes in them just to help remove surface hair. The things I get from that is I get a cleaner surface, better color retention, uh, less peeling, and uh, but it only works on cotton, uh, the cellulase enzymes. Uh, you can use protease enzymes on wool. There's not an enzyme that's going to improve the uh, polyester. Great, thank you. That actually answered some more questions people had about um, detergents and how detergents might help with peeling. So that's really interesting that uh, some detergents contain cellulase enzymes. Let, let me mention to you that back in these uh, late 70s, early 80s, uh, Cotton Incorporated worked with the Tide uh, group. Uh, Mike Tyndall had done a lot of work at Cotton Incorporated on enzyme treatments on garments every time they were washed and he showed that uh, they would not get fuzzy and lose their color as much. And it just so happened that Proctor and Gamble had done the same thing independent of each other. And uh, so when two companies not working on a project together come up with the same result, it normally means something. So for a long time, Tide was uh, sold with a cotton logo on it. We supported their research work and saying, uh, and they were saying that if you use this every load, you're gonna improve the appearance of the fabric. So yep, a lot of uh, detergents uh, do have enzymes. They don't particularly uh, highlight it much anymore because so many of them do do that. Great, okay. I'm gonna kind of combine some questions together here for you, um, specifically about the strength of fibers and how it relates to pilling. Um, so a couple of people are asking about that, that no pill um, polyester, and, and what that has to do with anti-pilling, but also could you explain why in a pilling tester, a cotton fabric might have a better appearance after 60 minutes than it would at th after 30 minutes? 
I was hoping somebody would ask me that last one. Let's do the last one first. Okay. The cotton fiber is strong, but if you rub on it enough in that type of environment, it'll come off. Uh, you think about abrasion resistance. When you do an abrasion resistance test on cotton, uh, it will wear off. So all those cases, that's why I said I always like to see 60 minutes, not just 30, because I've seen them get better because those anchors break off. Now, if that's polyester, that's so strong, the fiber strength goes back to the first part of the question. If you got a fiber that's very strong and very little affects it in terms of laundry care and things of that nature, like a polyester, it's inert. I mean, it's, it doesn't swell from water. Uh, so it's, it's going to stay strong. So if you got a pilling tendency, it's not going anywhere. But again, the cotton, and especially I also mentioned the wrinkle-resistant finish makes the fiber a little weaker. Those fibers will break off and your pilling will get better. Now, not every fabric does that, but I've seen, I've seen it on uh, where some pilling after 30 minutes disappeared or got better after 60 because the fibers break off. Great, thank you so much. Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, a few people are asking about um, kind of blends, especially cotton rayon blends and um, how you might reduce pilling in blends that contain um, rayon as well as other synthetics. Let's take the cotton rayon first. The first thing I would tell you is do not wash and tumble dry it. Have it dry cleaned. Uh, rayon, by its nature, fibrillates. Uh, when it uh, is in water, it swells and the abrasion resistance goes up. You guys think about this. If you want to turn a page in a book and it won't turn easy, what do you do? You just moisten your finger a little bit and that page turns easy because of the abrasion, uh, the, the surface friction goes up with a little bit of moisture. Well, the rayons, and it doesn't matter really which ones, some are better than others, but they will fibrillate, get little small fibrils on the surface and they tend to dull the color and they can peel because they're very strong. Now, however, a rayon is, has an advantage over polyester in that rayon, when it's wet, even high wet modulus rayon will get weaker when it's wet than it is when it's dry. So that may improve that, but the fibrillation kind of carries the day. So all the work I've done, and I can only speak on what I've done and what I've seen, that doesn't mean everything in the world would react that way. Uh, don't wash and tumble dry rayon, uh, dry clean it and uh, it, it will fibrillate. There's some end uses that people like to put rayons in and because they get weaker when they wet and they fibrillate, uh, they don't always look good. Uh, if you look at polyester and nylon, polyester is inert, doesn't swell, the water doesn't hurt it that in one way or the other. And uh, so it's strong, it stays strong. Uh, it was mentioned a minute ago and I kind of got away from it, the low pills, one, one thing about low pills, they found a way to make it weaker. But the main thing was all the low pills I saw were high denier polyesters. So back in our discussion where I said we go to two and a quarter or higher on fleece to have less anchors, when you start doing that, uh, you got a higher strength fabric. However, uh, your drape goes away a little bit because that coarser denier is stiffer. And so that same thing would be true with... Uh, Nylon, acrylics, uh, they'll peel because they're strong. Uh, nylon will absorb some water. Rayon absorbs a lot, fibrillates, but uh, most of the synthetics are strong before and after they're wet and they won't give up their, uh, their anchors. Again, I wanna stress that if there's no lint in that washer and dryer, they won't peel. There'd be very little synthetic fibers come out on, a, say, 100% spun poly. If you just wash that by itself, it shouldn't peel. You got a lot of anchors there. Now, you might get, uh, if they're really long and stick off the surface, you might get natural peels, but not laundry peels. So, uh, but as soon as you start adding something to that load of laundry or in that test method, uh, you will uh, you'll add those fibers. Uh, I had people tell me once on some blends that they were washing that they did not, and they did pill tests, they did not have any pilling. So we went out and looked at the samples uh, because when they sold it to the brand, the brand had problems with it. So we went out and looked, and in the mill, they weren't putting any fiber in the random pill tester. So if they don't put that short cotton fiber in that tester, 
is not going to have anywhere the amount of pilling that you would if you did use it. So you got to know the test method and you got to know if they follow it. I hope that answered the question. That's Yes, absolutely. And um, that's all the time that we have today for questions. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, if you do have more questions, I encourage you to check out cottonworks.com. We have a specific section called quality insurance that includes a lot of information on pilling. And you can also always reach out to us um, through the contact form on the website. So thank you so much, Don, for presenting today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, you will be able to see this webinar in a couple days time on cottonworks.com slash webinars. Thank you. Thank you.